Hello, and welcome to this fifth episode of Low Season Traveller Insider Guides. I'm Jed Brown, founder of Low Season Traveller, and this is the second of two episodes where I'm joined by the founder and CEO of the World Tourism Association for Culture and Heritage, Chris Flynn. This week, we delve further into the issue and see if there are reasons to be optimistic. So, Chris, in last week's episode, you painted a relatively concerning picture of what lies ahead. In general, how optimistic are you that our future generations are going to be able to enjoy the rich diversity of culture and heritage which we have had the privilege of enjoying during our careers? Yeah, we've kind of taken it for granted, haven't we? The, 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 the simple answer to that, Jed, is I don't know. Hmm. I'm being absolutely honest there. You know, three days ago, the Turkish government, the Turkish uh, Tourism Minister of Culture, stood up and they, uh, they announced that they'd achieved about 40 million visitors. Uh, in 2018. Fantastic, great result. Um, they have a, a very diverse range of products, you know, from coastal resorts to, you know, historical heritage sites, amazing culture. Turkey is an amazing place. But what disturbed me, and uh, I'll be writing to them about this, is that in the same breath, they announced that they wanted to almost double that figure by 2023. That's four years away. Hmm. So how can you go from 40 million visitors to 70 plus million visitors in, in four years and have all the bells and whistles in place, get all the institutions and everybody affected and all the key decision makers and all the different government departments and institutions all on the same page, all the cogs turning in the same direction in three years. It ain't going to happen. He said in the same brief, and I'm not having a go at him here because mm. this is all full of good intention. But as they say, the road to hell was built or paved yeah. with good intention, yeah. right? Um, he said, he, he made the point in his speech that 5,000 stolen works of art have been returned to Turkey that should never have left the Turkish shores. I agree. He said that 2,000 more were actually being repatriated as, they, as he speaks. We're talking 7,000 pieces of art. Now, wherever these pieces of art were, whether they were in museums or in private collections, they would have been protected. No one's going to destroy them because of the value of these particular things, monetary or otherwise. So how can you have millions of people? Because the next part, of his, 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 next part of his speech was, we're going to drive tourism growth through increased access to our historical and archaeological sites. So how do you, can you protect 7,000 pieces of art on one side that should have never have left the country and have a million people trudging all over your archaeological sites and thinking, hey, they're going to, be, they're going to remain the same. So... This is what I'm saying. The, 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 the mindset is, needs to change. The way we consider things need to change. It's not about growth. It's about, well, it's, it's about growth, but it's about growth in a way that is going to sustain and protect what we have for future generations. It's, um, you know, it's the, 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 this kind of argument that, that from, from what we heard from Turkey a couple of days ago is happening all over the place. And it's purely out of coming back to this short-term KPI mentality, where on my watch, I want to increase by 30 million visitors. Wouldn't that look great on my resume? Got to get away from that. It should be on my watch, I'm going to limit access to this, this, and this. I'm going to attract the people who want to, to visit here. I'm not going to market this broadly around the world. I'm going to, I'm going to target this through the Smithsonian or the or the Victorian Albert Museum. I'm going to ensure that what I do, everything I do is there to protect what we have, but do it through promoting it in a completely different way. It's not access all areas anymore. It can't be access all areas anymore. It has to be restricted for the right the right purposes. And look, it's, it's clear that governments have a, a huge amount of responsibility on this. And let me say, there's, there's, no, there's no blame on this. Everything that's been done has been done with the best intentions as far as uh, the, 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 the knowledge would have it. Um, what about the private sector? Obviously, you know, the private sector in terms of tourism, uh, the tourism industry, uh, it's the likes of the hoteliers, for example, the, the tour operators. They, they, they're also culpable um, in all of this, and they also have a huge responsibility. So I, I know that hoteliers obviously lobby governments in order to get new properties put up because they need to grow. They've got their KPIs. They need to get more uh, hotel beds in more parts of the world. 
what what role do they have in this and um are you are you working with the private sector in this way yeah we're trying to i mean we, we, we as, as private sector industry um we 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 seem to think that we have a social license to operate on our terms we don't we may have had but we don't anymore we need to we we, we need to, we, we we really need to take a not just one breath, but a series of breaths and start to look at the impact that we, that we do. As I say, tourism can be a fantastic uh, economic asset. You know, it's a great employer, the infrastructure, all this kind of stuff. So it increases wealth, but it can't be wealth at all costs. We don't have a social license to operate. We can't just do that. We need to justify why we're doing things. I'm doing some work in the, in the Pacific on, uh, on a destination in the Pacific at the moment. And this is this is a series of islands, a, a, a most beautiful part of the world. Nine hundred and ninety-two islands. It's got this particular country, and they they are they have a they have a um, a completely blank canvas. Currently, they only get seven thousand tourists a year for nine hundred and ninety-two islands. Right. So you can imagine it's quite amazing. But they they became aware, or I made them aware very early on, that the the unique thing that we have as destinations. Is culture, you know, in a, in a homogenized society that we live in right now, where everything's the same and all the high street stores are the same and all the brands that we we have in our kitchen are the same. In the future, the only thing that will that will separate us from the rest of the world is our cultural identity, that invisible skin that we wear that tells people instinctively who we are. Um, so when I spoke with this particular destination, and they were seeking investment, I said, "You need you can." You need to get the right tourists. You need to get the right investment. It can't be investment at all costs. You don't necessarily want a high rise on the beach. And we've heard all this before. So as part of their investment portfolio, they, uh, they have two catchphrases, which we worked on together. One is invest to protect. So whoever invests in, in, in their community is there to protect their culture and heritage and invest to preserve. So these are the two phrases that they use in all their investment uh, IM documents and portfolios. And anyone who steps into that community has to follow the principles and the procedures of government because they realize that is their key asset. That is their key point of difference for the future. And anyone who just wants to build whatever, not interested. Even though we've only got 7,000 tourists, we're going to build this on our terms. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of approach we need to take. Yeah. So where we have, you know, a destination that might have massive over tourism in one particular area, then dispersal is a good thing. We know that, but it can't be dispersal at all costs yeah. because what we're actually, again, that we're seeing, and this is happening all over the place. Is if we've got too many tourists here, let's put them over there. Well, good in theory, but again, unless you've got a plan, there's a destination in, in India, in the Rajasthan area, Jaipur, mm -hmm. suffering from, Serious over tourism in peak season. Seasonality is another issue. Um, their idea, and again, this, this, is, this has been done with good intentions. It's just a little bit crazy, in my opinion. Their idea was let's build some road signs and let's put these road signs uh, on the roads as people are approaching Jaipur that says, hey, do you know there's little hamlets over here? Do you know there's historical sites over there? They're directing people into people's homes and villages and towns that have had no exposure to tourism whatsoever. They don't even know what tourism is. They just happen to have these amazing archaeological sites that they've grown up with, like me and my Roman bridge. Yeah. So what's going to happen? You know what's going to happen? People are going to step in and they're going to go, okay, there's money to be made in this. You know, Mr. Brown, you've got this beautiful thing on your property here. If I give you X, can I, gain, can I get access to that exclusively? You're not going to know what's going to happen there. The fact is, They'll give them a tiny amount to get access to whatever. And then once that has been exploited, once that's been probably destroyed, Mr. Brown's left with nothing. Um, it's, gone for, it's gone forever. And they move down to the next town. And that's because we're not facing up to the problems that we have created. We've not fa we're not facing the problems head on that we have caused through driving traffic, either through peak times or, or, or whenever, uh, in a manner that has balance, that has a balanced approach. It's all been a me, me, me kind of attitude that has driven this. And, um, and that has to stop. And the thing is, once we have a problem, then don't just make it up. 
don't just don't just get in a boardroom and sit around with a few people and put your hand up and say hey about how's this idea you need to work with organizations like us we're, we're, ironically you're going to find this hard to believe yet we are the only organization on the planet that specializes in this when you talk about 1.8 billion tourists and you have one organization from tourism that specializes in this protection of heritage and culture it's hard to get your head around that isn't it it's absolutely it, incredible yeah and that was done out of necessity because it didn't exist mm. so as i say i didn't do this to become a hero or a missionary I, I did this i did this because we do have probably five years to get things in place to start turning this bloody big ship around and it's not easy so so that's why you know that's why i'm doing this call, this call with you, Jed, getting up at bloody 5.30 in the morning and <laughs> making myself a cup of tea. I don't mind doing that. It's, um, it's it has to be done. It has to be done. It's, it's interesting because we, obviously, we've known each other for, for many years. And, you know, I guess, unrelated, really, we, we, we kind of, I think, have concerns of the same sort of nature, which is, broadly speaking, it's too much tourism that's unmanaged um, and unrestricted at all and that was exactly what was going through my head with low season traveler now my my own take on it was that over tourism which is the the phrase which seems to be coming up time and time again over tourism is, is essentially for me you know a large part of that is, is to do with seasonality which which you touched on there before and my thoughts i started looking into it and was looking at you know responsible tourism and there's a lot of responsible tourism organizations out there that were saying, you know, yep, over tourism, the way in which you combat over tourism is you divert people to new destinations. So instead of going to Barcelona, uh, go to Split or wherever else, some other destination. And that, that didn't sit right with me because I feel like that other destination, you know, the smaller destinations that aren't getting as much tourists, exactly your point, really, they're, you know, they're not ready for it. They're not prepared for it. Now, if you're talking about Barcelona during the low season, and you know you, you touched actually on Turkey there before, I had a look at the the stats for Turkey um, over the past couple of years, and it's something like 80% of their tourism is between May and uh, the end of October, 80%. So that means that there's a there's a capacity during the winter months, which is absolutely huge. So therefore, they've got the infrastructure for all of those tourists. But and they've got the beds, they've got everything to do with the whole tourism offering, um, but they haven't got the tourists there in the winter. So for, for me, my solution on that was, well, actually, if you can start as an industry to promote the low seasons in these destinations that are already geared up for tourism, uh, then that that is one way of easing the the situation. What what's your take on the the seasonality issue? Okay, two two things that are, that are, I, I took from that. Um, one is this this idea to just shuffle people around too many here let's put them somewhere there that's just moving the problem it's not yeah. fixing the problem you know and that kind of that, that that kind of idea is what got us into this trouble in the food in the, in the first place the whole idea of seasonality is a really interesting one uh, you know and what you're doing is, is is bloody smart now let's get back to turkey again mm. they made two announcements the announcement they made you know two or three days ago focused on two key areas. One of them was, or, or, one of them was growing this number, you know, or, or to grow this number, the two key areas. One was to give greater access to their historical sites. The other one was to do away with seasonality. Now, first destination I have seen or heard saying that. So mm. they want to get away from this peaks and troughs. They want a more balanced approach. So they are, they are actively starting to, to look at this. Now, this is a really smart move, really, in my opinion. To counter that, we have situations with other institutions or, or other sort of institutional thinking that says, what about the education sector? What's driving peak? It's education. Mm. It's kids at school. Yeah. So my daughter breaks up from school. The price will go from $200 normally to $1,000, whatever, for whatever it is I'm buying. Because we know we can, we can, we can put that out and we're going to fill that aircraft or we're going to fill, fill that cruise ship or we're going, to, we're going to get more people through our turnstiles. Right? Interestingly enough, the school that my daughter goes to here in Sydney, a lot of what she does is online. 
So the assignments that she does and the homework that she does is online. So whereas you and I probably, you know, did our homework, if we did our homework. On a and, slate. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, and handed the slate into the teacher the following morning with an apple. You know, um, that's gone now. My daughter has to, to submit her homework by seven o'clock the night before online. So um, and her school holidays, like now, all her assignments are done at home, online, and submitted before she gets to school. So this whole idea of taking the classroom out of the classroom, if you will, mm -hmm. and allowing families to travel at a time that suits them for a price that suits them by aggregating yield over a 12-month period, not having this graph that looks like some kind of heartbeat monitor, by starting to look at how we can shift and change this using technology, using other means, it's actually far more efficient for my daughter because I know she has to get it done. You know, so if I'm, if I'm overseas on holiday with Simon and Johnny and we were down at the beach during the day and we come back at three o'clock when it's, you know, our day's over, then Simon and Johnny can do their homework between three and five, submit it online and off we go for dinner. Yeah. That kind of idea is, I think, is something that we need as a society to, to, to factor in. We have the means to do it. Just about every kid that goes to school has got a laptop or a, or a, or a, a, you know, a tablet or, or whatever. They have the means to do it. So we need to change our thinking the way we do it. I, I'm, as I say, my daughter's school, have already made that approach. So the, the idea of shifting people out of peak season has to happen. Peak season's full. No more room at the end. We, we can't keep growing it unless we keep shifting and shuffling people around. And the thing is, if you ask anyone who's being, you know, tagged behind a tour guide with a flag, is this what they signed up for? They'll say no. If you ask any cruise passenger that got off, I'll tell them to talk about cruise in a second, that got off a ship, you know, in one of these key ports around the world, these historical ports, because they're going to Venice for the historical side of things. They're not going there to shop, right? Yeah. So... Is this what you anticipated when you're being forced and squeezed through these little back streets of Venice? No, it's not. This is not what I signed up for. No, there's, a, there's another destination in the Pacific that I've done some work with, and they had a problem with cruise. And I'm not bagging cruise. This, you know, cruise is, is, is terrific, but again, it's like you've, you've got to be done responsibly. It's got to be done with the right mindset. They, uh, they had an issue with their runway, and their runway had cracks in it, and as a result, they had a couple of airlines pull out. It wasn't safe to land. So they lost a huge amount of capacity. So from a hotel perspective, just about every hotel on the islands are SMEs, small, medium enterprises, running small, privately owned um, properties. They went from probably running at 70% occupancy to anywhere between 5 and 20% occupancy. So you've got a problem. So the cruise companies you know, came to the rescue and they got the ministers involved and the ministers are not tourism experts and they, they said, oh, we can increase your economy by X, Y, and Z. And the interesting thing with cruise reports is the vast majority of them has been sponsored by cruise companies. So there seems to be um, you know, a slight sort of sway in favor of certain things. So what happened is this destination, so you think about a small, any small destination in the Pacific, Jed, and think about how many cruise ships they might be able to take. Give me a number. Just give me a number of what a small little island nation in the Pacific might want to take from a cruise perspective. 15, 20. Yeah. Last year, they got 320 ships into, into a port that, and, uh, that is literally three streets long. In fact, it's two and a half streets long. Practically a ship a day. Yeah. But they moved some of these ships into some of the outer islands. So some of these outer islands have local tribes that have been living this way for thousands of years. They're usually naked for the majority of the time. It's a bit like the Jarawa tribe that we talked about before in, uh, in, this, in the Andaman Sea. Now, these communities might have 100, 200 people living with them. I've been living this way for, as I say, thousands of years. What does it do to your psychology, to the way you think, when you see a 2,000 birth ship turn up on your doorstep out of nowhere three times a week. How can you ever go back to the way you thought before? It destroys not just the culture, it destroys the very way they think. Um, I'm not gonna get into some of the problems that have happened in this particular destination, but their minister used two phrases to me. 
uh, when I met with him last time. He said, we are in distress and we are fatigued. And that was caused through over tourism driven by crews and crews seek finding an opportunity that they could exploit. Let's be completely open and honest about this. They weren't, they, they weren't thinking of the culture. They weren't thinking of protecting that destination. They were thinking about how much money they could make out of that. And they were, they were negotiating with people with good intention that were ignorant of the consequences of their actions. And this is what's happening everywhere. But it's, that's, the, that's the governments that were accepting those cruise lines though, right? Absolutely. They're, they're, the, they're the ones that, that negotiate with it. That's uh, right. That's right. But, but who, there was no go-to place to ask for advice. Yeah. Who, who would they go to? Who, who would they ask? World Tourism Association for Culture and Heritage, WETAC, didn't exist then. Hmm. They know now that they can pick up the phone. They can send me an email and say, Chris, you know, or one of my team, you know, this is the situation. This is what we. This is what we're faced with. This is the opportunity that we've been we've been provided with. Will this benefit what we are trying to achieve as a destination? And we will say, we would look at the numbers and we would say, well, you know, if you do this, then yeah, of course it is. We're we're not going to turn around and say, oh, cruise ships are terrible for destinations. They're not. They're fantastic things. They just have to be done in a respectful manner. This industry's taken advantage of of ignorance so long uh, for our own benefit to line our own pockets to drive our own agenda it's got to stop otherwise we're just going to become the next plastic in the ocean when you say you know the, the, the cruise industry can be you know a good thing for tourism talk me through that because that that's one thing I'll, first of all i should admit i've never been on a cruise in my life um i i have you know, in the past in my career, I had an interest in the cruising industry, although I've never worked within the cruising industry. I know it's growing hugely uh, all over the world. Um, the penetration is still low, but there's seeks to grow it further, certainly in Asia Pacific. I, 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 to be honest, I never really understood it because I used to speak to some of the tourism guys in the South Pacific, uh, the Caribbean, everywhere else. And if you report of call um, are on these uh, cruise routes, I, I don't understand what, what really the upside is because for, for most of them, the, the trips on the island are booked and paid for on the cruise ship. Uh, so the money stays there. They get off. They go and have a quick look round on this tour that's been booked through the cruise company, which the cruise company get the money for. Then they come back on the ship to eat and also sleep as well. And the ship, after arguably polluting the waters, then disappears. Uh, talk to me about the upside of cruising for a, a, a small island that's on a, a port of call. Okay, well, you've, you've, you've basically highlighted most of the, the things that I think as well. And, and you, <laughs> you know, um, I've never been on a cruise. Um, I think the first thing that you need to look at with cruising, and this is something that destinations don't necessarily, certainly emerging destinations don't necessarily think, think about. People go on a cruise to go on a cruise. They don't go on a cruise to go to a destination. They're going to go on the cruise that fits their pocket. Mm -hmm. And if that cruise takes you to Timbuktu or, you know, the Caribbean or anywhere else, they're not really that bothered. If they get off and spend a couple of dollars here and there locally on, on the shore, that is the economic benefit that goes to those communities. Now in, in small economies, um, if you had a handful of cruises, if you were to get one cruise a month, to some of these smaller destinations in the Pacific or elsewhere, then people would get off that ship. They would see the real product. They will see the, the real destination and they would share with the local communities. That's the upside. What happened in the destination I was just talking about is because the local people weren't being employed because of the issues with the runway, they saw these big vessels coming in and they were all scrambling to try and make a dollar out of it. This caused in tribal fighting and literally riots on the shore. So the cruise company said, don't get off unless you are going on one of our tours. Don't worry about buying the local artifacts. You can buy them on the ship. The local artifacts actually came from Bali. Really? And again, that was, told, that was told to me by the minister. So there was no economic benefit to that to, to the local communities there because it had been done completely wrong. So by managing the capacity of a cruise ship or a vessel and its ability to go to a port it could have that value. That's the, that's the upside. Yeah. But there's so much more negative side. Do you know that it's still 
uh, possible for a cruise ship to dump whatever it wants into the ocean as long as it's 12 nautical miles away from shore. Did not know that. So, so once it's 12 nautical miles away from the port, it can, if it wants to, it can dump whatever it wants into the ocean. The other thing about it is, you know, the aviation sector comes into a lot of flack because you see all these, you know, contrails in the sky and what have you. You know, they're vapor trails. They're basically water vapor. These ships are running on diesel. Think about that in the ocean. Yeah. So it can have, it, it can, a tour, you know, if it's done right, you know, the economic benefit can have an upside to a destination. It can also show maturity in a destination by its ability to take a cruise ship. So that can actually put a different slant on the, on the consumer mindset. Um, but you have to put into call, call into question, what is the ROI on cost of building the infrastructure to manage these vessels? Small destinations are never going to get that back. Mm. It's impossible. So the economics of, of cruise shipping is, is something that, again, is not readily understood uh, by a lot of smaller emerging destinations. So cruise ships can have positive benefit in certain areas, but, you must always come back to what those people are buying. They're buying a cruise. They're not buying. They're not buying um, something to take them to a particular destination. I think. I think it's it's that it's that thing, isn't it? Where uh, again, I think collectively as an industry, we need to think about the destinations and the communities in the destinations before we think about the holiday makers the the travelers and i think we've always put the travelers first so if the if the if the market you know wants to go to vanuatu then we need to build hotels on vanuatu and it, you know the starting point has always been what the, what the travelers want what the market wants rather than putting the you know the communities first and the destinations first yes and no i i agree with that i i, I think the focus has always been on the bottom line yeah. it's always been on what we make What's the upside for us? If, we're, if, if, if this is my business, what can I make by going to, as you say, Vanuatu? Can I make money on that? Is it worth my while? There is never any discussion in any boardroom that I've been in where it says, okay, if we do this, what is the consequences of our actions? What happens if we go from running 16 cruise ships a year to running 120? Because at the moment it goes, okay, well, we can maximize our revenue on this and we will make X amount of dollars on, on, on every um, port of call that we do on this particular, this particular cruise. If we you know, multiply that by 10, we're going to make X. Wow, fantastic. Great for the shareholders. Great for my bonus. What are the consequences of our actions on the communities that we affect? That has never been a consideration. If it was... We wouldn't have the problems that we have in Iceland. We wouldn't have the problems that we have in Barcelona, Dubrovnik, Venice, um, and other destinations like that. In certain areas like Rapa Nui, that's just been purely down to miscalculations, misguided information, and a lack of understanding of what will happen if we do this. All done with good intention. So, you know, there's, there's two ways of thinking on this. But everything has been usually driven by profit and yield, yeah. as opposed to consequence and action. Oh. Yeah. So probably probably fair to say that, that the World Tourism Association for Culture and Heritage is serving communities rather than shareholders. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Again, nothing wrong with making money. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. You know, the world needs to do that. I mean, a sustainable thing in 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 the environment when we talk about sustainability is making money. Because if you don't make money, you don't make profit, you can't exist. It's what you do with it that matters and that counts. It's how you reinvest that money and that profit is how you share equitably with the money that you make from communities to ensure that they can survive, that they're sustainable, that you improve their livelihoods. That's the difference. And that is what's never been considered by tourism. In my opinion, is the fact that what do we need to do? What do we need to give back to ensure that we protect things for the future? That has to change and it has to change quickly. Otherwise, well, we're already in trouble yet, you know, and uh, we, we, uh, we've got to change the way people operate, the way people think, and uh, do it for all the right reasons. You know, something has to change. Chris, on that note, I think we'll start to wrap things up. Conscious that uh, you're looking like it's getting warm over there uh, as the sun's <laughs> getting up and it's getting a bit later in the day. Yes, it's already. I've not even looked at the temperature yet. It feels about 40 degrees. I'm not quite sure what the temperature will be today, Jed, but um, it'll be warm. It'll certainly be warmer than where you are. I can guarantee mm -hmm. that. 
Absolutely sure of it. Chris, a pleasure as always. Thanks a million for your time. And um, if people want to find out more, uh, they can go on to the website, which is www.wtach.org. I'll post up um, some of the links to some of the blogs and articles that you've written as well up onto the podcast page so that if anybody wants to find out more information, they can get it from there. Absolutely, Jed. It's always, lo- always lovely to talk to you, mate. And anything that I can do to, to support you and, you know, if we can work together uh, on, 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 you know, certain issues, that'll be great. Perfect. Thanks a million again, Chris, for your time. Appreciate it. And that's a wrap. Huge thanks again to Chris for sharing his insights with us over the past two weeks. And you can find out more info and links about the work of WeTAC in the podcast description and on the lowseasontraveller.com website. As always, if you have any feedback or comments on these issues, or if you'd like to see an issue or destination featured, please do email us at lowseasontraveller at gmail.com. And if you enjoyed the podcast, don't forget to share it with your friends and social networks. Look out for the next episode on iTunes and Spotify, or even better, subscribe and receive it automatically. It's free for everyone, as we believe that travel is better without the crowds.